What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat? Or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? Hi everyone, it's Mike today with a review of the classic play A Raisin in the Sun by Lorraine Hansberry. I picked this one up for a book club that I was theoretically going to participate in at work, but it took me long enough to get to it that the group's discussion of this book is long past. Still, I think it's worth a uh, discussion here. I enjoyed reading it, and it was also pretty fast to read since it's quite short. I have to admit I hadn't heard of this play before it was suggested for this book club, although I've now encountered references to it several times just in the last few months, so maybe I just wasn't paying enough attention. The book, which is really a play, debuted on Broadway in 1959 the first Broadway performance produced by a black woman. Uh, thus, it was considered a big risk at the time since it centered on black characters and a black cast at a time even shortly before the civil rights movement of the 60s. Yet, the play was largely well received and was nominated for several awards at the time. The title A Raisin in the Sun is from the Langston Hughes poem Harlem that I read at the beginning of this review, and the play evokes a similar sentiment to that of Arthur Miller's play Death of a Salesman, which I read in school and debuted on Broadway 10 years earlier before this play, and touches on similar themes of the American dream, exploring whether the dream can really be achieved by everyone. Yet, it would be an oversimplification to equate the two plays entirely for reasons I'll mention in a second. There will be some mild spoilers in this review. I'm not going to say how it ends, but I will say a few things about the characters and their experiences that we learn throughout the book. I also want to thank Bree from the channel The Locked Book Titian. I recently followed her live discussion of this book, which I'll link below. And although I'd mostly written this review a month or two prior to that conversation, just hadn't recorded it yet, participating in that uh, really enhanced my understanding of some of the characters and what they represent. Uh, so huge credit to everyone in that discussion for the ideas they shared. The story of this play revolves around the life of a black family. A man is living with his mother and his wife and his son and his sister in a crowded apartment in South Chicago. The matriarch of the family is about to receive her life insurance payout following the death of her husband, and while she has aspirations of moving the family to a better house in a nicer, that is, white neighborhood, uh, her children have other hopes. One of them, the son, hoping to invest the money in a get-rich-quick scheme that will get him and his family out of their financial troubles, and the other, the feminist-inclined daughter, wanting the money to pay for her college education. The heart of the story revolves around these characters as they make decisions about what's best for the family in a situation that was relatable not only for middle-class black audiences of the time, but for whites as well. And yet the temptation to cast this story as a universal struggle in which the main family could have been black, could have been white, could have been anyone, is too dismissive of the specific struggles faced by this family at the intersection of a middle class identity and a black identity. The version of this book that I read had an introduction section reflecting on the play and its success 50 plus years later, and it comments on this point, a point that author Hansberry, as well as the author of the introduction, believe was missed by many critics at the time. Indeed, the family in this book faces a number of challenges specific to black families, including most prominently some unforeseen obstacles in the moving process, but also lots of other little things that affirm the black identity of this particular family, even if also challenging them. Beyond that, a broad-thinking viewer or reader might wonder what are the circumstances that place this family in the middle class in the first place rather than uh, the upper class, and whether their white contemporaries would have encountered the same challenges. Everything I've mentioned so far is more of an intellectual, academic criticism of the ideas and themes within the play, so I can't forget to mention that beyond this rich discussion of race and class and the struggle to achieve the American dream, the characters in this play are a joy to meet and to watch interact, each of them with their own strengths and biases that make them feel real and relatable, and often lead to interesting little clashes between family members of different opinions. And they each have their own strengths and weaknesses. The mother is the rock of stability that holds the family together, but her traditional values find her in conflict with her daughter-in-law and others of the family. Walter, the father, is someone who, at least I read, as a troubled man, who is motivated by seemingly good intentions to fulfill the stereotypical role of the man as expected in his family and provide for his wife and child, but the way he does this and the way he interacts with his wife often seem to espouse a certain lack of understanding of how this striving for personal success at all costs is affecting the others of the family. His wife Ruth is both devoted to him and also enormously frustrated with him and his business schemes, in whose pursuit he becomes rather oblivious to everything going on in the family, including his own wife's pregnancy, something that's already quite obvious to all the other women in the family. Walter's college-going sister Benita is especially interesting. She's somewhat of a feminist, although in her youthful naivete she has a lot to learn as well. 
Her relationships with two men are illustrative of the options available to black women of her class at the time. Her respectable black boyfriend, George, would be the obvious choice for marriage, yet he is bland and uninteresting and seems to view her basically as property. By contrast, her Nigerian classmate, Asagai, with whom she becomes captivated during the play, exposes her to a sort of pan-Africanism that really broadens her perspective of what's out there, yet we eventually see in him an almost repulsive attitude of condescension. He wants to bring her home with him and make her his African queen. I think that's the actual phrasing he uses, but a queen filling his own needs and subordinate to him nevertheless. So yeah, the characters in this play are written with depth, uh, highly believable and human, and impressively well-developed given the limited screen time each of them receives in this fairly short performance. That is really all I've got, though, for my short review of this short but powerful play. I absolutely recommend checking out this play sometime, and if you do, please let me know what you thought. I'm sure that for this 60-year-old play, you could find plenty of rich analysis and discussions, and maybe even performances, on YouTube, although I haven't yet looked for them myself. I'm going to stop here, though, and if you want to hear more uh, weekly reviews on a whole variety of interesting topics, uh, like this video and subscribe to my channel. Until next time, bye, and happy reading.